So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are here, uh, both uh, Jill and I are here to um, have a conversation about just being able to cope with having a serious illness and also talking about mindfulness exercises uh, as a part of coping. And uh, so Jill, if you'd like to introduce yourself, that'd be wonderful as a start. Sure. So my name is Jill Mall, and I'm a patient navigator at Johns Hopkins in medical oncology, helping breast cancer patients of particularly young early stage patients and all ages of women living with metastatic disease. Um, I'm also a breast cancer survivor. I was diagnosed myself at 32 years old. My twins were four years old and uh, it's been 17 years since I was diagnosed. And uh, I've been working at Johns Hopkins for eight years now in this position. Well, oh, amazing. Hi, uh, I'm Rob Brzak. I'm a palliative medicine doctor. I'm over at University Hospitals, Cleveland Medical Center, and uh, as well as Case Western, where I'm a clinical associate professor, and I'm the clinical director of palliative care uh, for University Hospitals, Cleveland Medical Center, as well as the program director for our uh, hospice and palliative medicine fellowship. So what we are gonna do here is just have a conversation, a fireside chat um, about the work that we do and you know how and conversations that we have with our, with our patients and, and colleagues. Yeah, I mean, it's just a very stressful thing. When you are diagnosed with cancer, it's not something you just put on your to-do list, right? You have a very busy life, you have possibly a job or you're dating or you're married or you have kids or you have pets or you have, there's, there's a whole world going on around you. And then we throw this kind of lead ball at you that you have cancer and that's a lot to cope with. So, I mean, we, we're going to try to help you with some ways of how to make that burden a little bit easier on the day to day. Exactly. Great. Thanks. So shall we start? <laughs> do it. Let's do it. So tell me a little bit, I guess, my question for you would be in palliative care, um, a, a little bit about the type of patients that you deal with who have cancer and where mm -hmm. they are kind of in the trajectory of cancer diagnosis. Sure. So um, as a palliative um, care doctor, you know, I take care of people with any serious illness from heart failure to dementia to cancer. And uh, the can uh, patients with cancer that I take care of are some people who were just diagnosed with, the, with cancer. And they've got symptoms that are difficult to manage or bothersome. And what I do is sit down with them, figure out, number one, who they are, because you're more than your cancer, mm -hmm. more than your cancer diagnosis, right? So getting a real true sense of who you are, the people that, that matter to you, what matters to you, uh, getting a sense of how you're feeling and how you're coping with, with your illness, as well as you know how your family and and caregivers are coping with with you being ill because sometimes it can take a significant toll on families and caregivers and we want to be able to not only support the people our patients that we take care of but also their caregivers yeah i mean i think the hardest thing to do when you have cancer is everyone said to me don't think about the future just stay present don't think about the chemotherapy, the surgery, the radiation. Just stay with the day of the treatment you're in. Don't think about the 10 years of hormonal therapy. You know, and it's, I think that's really difficult for people to stay present, right? And to not, people want to plan. They want to know what's coming forward. They want to know how they're going to feel, when they're going to feel bad, what's going to happen. And I think some of these coping mechanisms we're going to discuss, I hope, help patients and care partners, as you said, to really enjoy each moment every day because there's so much to be grateful for. And um, for me, I just really, it helped me to have a mantra to kind of turn down that volume, right? Like the cancer chatter, like, oh, am I going to be nauseous? Am I going to be sick? What's going to, you know, all the things, what's it going to feel like to lose my hair? And, you know, especially when you wake up in the middle of the night, a big problem is our patients don't sleep enough. Right. And why don't they sleep enough? Because their cancer chatter volume is so high. So how do we turn it down? And I know you are an expert with mindfulness and I would love to hear what you think about that. But for me, I simply had a mantra of 
it is what it is, or this too shall pass. And those two mantras got me through a lot of hard times mm. while my mind was going crazy. Um, it helped me to stay centered. It helped me to accept whatever I had to accept as my new reality. It helped me to forgive, to let go, and to really be able to move forward with my treatment. Okay. Oh, wow. To forgive, that was, that was really beautiful. Wow. And so, you know, I think um, you, you highlighted several things, and I wanted to sort of touch base about some of those things. So I think, number one, you know, people with cancer may have numerous symptoms, right? And so as a palliative care doc, I ask about all common symptoms that occur in patients. Pain, shortness of breath, nausea, you know, figuring out how their bowels are going, uh, seeing if they're anxious or if they're depressed. You know, some people also have dry mouth. You know, as you mentioned, some people can't sleep. So we touch base about all these symptoms, appetite, and, and we're experts at, at managing a lot of these symptoms. And at the same time, really want to make sure you know, what are some things you want to be able to do, mm -hmm. right? And, and then giving you and figuring out ways to give you those tools or helping you find those tools yourself to be able to get to that goal. And, and that's, that's something that's really critical. And we have an interdisciplinary team of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, chaplains to really help lift people up and, and help them through that whole navigation process and you've been amazing I, we so we've actually uh, worked together when i was at hopkins um as i tell people before i got fired uh and um i'm joking about that but um <laughs> people are like oh wow what's he doing no no we miss you we miss you <laughs> thank you thank you i miss you guys too uh it was it was a wonderful group total delight to work with you and so, so not only do we talk about symptoms, but we also, you know, give people tools, as I said. So if you're someone who's someone who's very spiritual or religious, being able to have a chaplain come by to support mm -hmm. you and lift you up. And it turns out when, you know, some of these services, along with palliative care, uh, come into play, people not only live better, but they also live longer, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, so I think that's something that's really important to recognize. And, uh, and in terms of being able to give and the specific tools for, you know, as you mentioned, you know, not being able to sleep or, you know, some people are just quite anxious, uh, giving them certain tools. And I think there's so many, there's so many tools out there, right? Which is, which is a, and, um, and I think finding what's right for you, mm -hmm. right? Because we have all this data, and and there, and a lot of this data can help people, but some people may not. It, it may not work for that specific person, uh, but it could possibly work for majority of people. And so, just recognizing that there's, and providing like personalized care for people. Yeah, yeah, right. I do think that's really important, and I think. Just some of the people who are listening to us today, you may not have ever had cancer, but you might have a genetic mutation that puts you at an increased risk of cancer, which is also going to increase your anxiety. It's going to increase your screenings. It's going to increase the way you live, you know, the way that you live your life may be different from somebody without a mutation. It's kind of like dealing with the same thing when it comes to the anxiety and the individuality of it. Um, sometimes people just feel they just want to be so positive that they're scared to feel sad and negative. And I do think that it's important to process that negative feeling or you're never going to feel positive, like label it, accept it, know that you may be angry, you may be worried, you may be whatever word fearful, and then process what that feels like to make room for the positivity. And I think that's something that people need to know. There is room for both in your um, world. You know, let's say if you're going to be sad, just don't, you know, I always say, take a vacation to sadness. Don't unpack your bags and stay there. It's, you need to process that. And I think that's when you find out you have a mutation or you find out you have cancer, or you find out you're at risk for something. These are things that are scary, um, but learning to live with it is what's important in having those coping mechanisms. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, I think 
And, and there is so much, um, there's actually data out there uh, in the, in, with the grief data. Uh, Lucy Hone, uh, she's a researcher out in uh, New Zealand and she wrote a book about resilient grieving. And when I think about this, not only, you know, losing like a loved one, right? But also having a serious illness, having a, a mutation or so to um, like grieving, you know, some people may have lost their personhood Mm -hmm. from being seriously ill, right? And being able to figure out, okay, how do I get this back? And it may not be the same as it was before. Maybe it could even be better. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. There's definitely silver linings. I, I think people say to me often, how do you feel so lucky that you had cancer at 32? Why, why is that an expression of your, you know, emotion? And to be honest, I do feel lucky not only did it change my perspective on so much? It gave me the job I have, which I am very grateful to be able to work with patients every day and help them through their journey and ease their burden. Um, whether it be doing legacy work and helping a parent, uh, you know, do recordings for their child in the future, if they might not be at future life events or helping a patient just deal with some side effects or simple tips of helping to get through chemo. I think that's a gift and I feel grateful that I can do it. And, um, you know, I do think that just to bring in mindfulness a little bit for me, I had a tough time with mindfulness when, so, so we had a group that Rob used to run at, at Hopkins called caring for the caregiver. So all of the caregivers that are caring for the patients also need mindfulness, right? We're, we're also stressed in trying to care for our patients because we care a lot and we want to do the best. And he would lead us in a mindfulness exercise, which maybe we'll try one a little bit later. And for me, I had to start with literally three deep breaths. Like that's all I could do to be mindful because I'm a pretty high energy person and always busy and on the go. But it is, there are even just simple breathing exercises people can do to be mindful and stay present and to really let their mind relax. I think, you know, when you're mindful, you can observe your thoughts and feelings without judging them. And that's a really hard thing to do. <laughs> I, you know, when I first came across mindfulness, I thought it was nonsense. I went to a workshop and there, and um, they let us do a 25 minute workshop uh, exercise. And right before that, I said, this is nonsense. Like, give me a break. And, and then I said, you know, I'm here, may as well. And I kept my mind open to it. And after, when I did that, I mean, my world opened up, right? I, I did this exercise and I was bawling like a baby <laughs> through this exercise. And, but right after I was done, I felt lighter. And, and then, um, and I was trying to figure out what is this thing, right? So I started looking at some of the data about it and, and was convinced. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a lot of data that shows that mindfulness can actually be helpful um, for pain, for anxiety, you know, and, and mood, uh, for sleep, um, and, um, and even like fatigue. So there's, there's so much that it can actually affect. So when I think about mindfulness, I, you know, there's, there's so much data that shows how beneficial it could be uh, to help with pain, to help with anxiety and depression, uh, to even help with like fatigue, yeah, right, and, and awareness. So you know, some of the uh, data actually shows that it actually um, it actually is helpful to be able to like enhance your attention to mm -hmm. things, right? And there's actually parts of your brain that actually light up because of it, right? And then it improves like your emotional regulation and reduces stress. And there's, you know, parts of your brain in the front frontal limbic networks there that can actually uh, take, uh, that actually takes a part in that. Um, and then, you know, as, as we talked about, like being more aware of things also. So there's a part in the front of your brain that sort of does that, does that part. So, um, it, it's been pretty cool to see a lot of the data and research out there on mindfulness and and how it can impact well-being and 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 being able to see like the actual data of how things in the brain are affected. It's it's really cool. Yeah, what I love about it, Rob, is that it's accessible to everybody. 
I mean, I think that there are a lot of coping mechanisms, whether we've looked into data for acupuncture and things, but things cost money. You have to go somewhere. Possibly you don't have access to do it in your community if you're in a rural community. So what I love about mindfulness is that we live in a really busy world and our minds are pulled in every direction. We have social media, phones, screens. Now we have Zoom. It's really exhausting. And I and then you put on top of that, oh, you have a genetic mutation or, oh, you have cancer and your mind is going to just keep on going. But mindfulness, you can do anytime, anywhere. You can do it at your desk. You can do it you know, well, maybe at your desk, not a long one, but a short one, <laughs> you can do, um, you can do it on a walk. You can, you can really find time to be mindful for a few minutes at any time and meditative. So I think that it's really, what I like about it is that it can be accessible to everybody. And, and that's, that really means a lot to me because I think sometimes we give coping mechanisms that aren't realistic for everybody. And I think the other, the other thing I'd like to add to that is that quite often when you're seriously ill, like there is so much that you have no control over, right? You don't have control over it, whether there's a recurrence. You don't have control over whether it's gonna work or not, right? And so this is something you actually have control over or you can have control over, but it takes, it takes practice. It's sort of like yeah. working out, right? Yeah. When you first do it, it's like, oh my God, I'm gonna die, right? Because <laughs> you're hurting, and then and then afterwards, when it becomes a pattern, you sort of build these muscles, you know, uh, to some extent, to be able to to be pliable, right? Yeah, it's about letting go, and I think that's really hard because the first things people want to control when they have a threat to their health is. For, for what I see the patients is usually exercise and food and things that they can control, you know, being extreme and saying, I'm going to become raw vegan because I have this mutation or because I have cancer is something you can control, but is it really going to help you in the long run through treatment and through the health of your life? I mean, it may or may not, but what you can control is your mind and your emotion and your body and, you know, the way you think of things and staying positive as we know and staying present as we know can really be mean a lot to people's health all yeah. the way around so yes it's you know i didn't think about it in that sense about being able to control it but it's true and i think the other thing you were talking about is you know you sort of indicated uh having rituals mm -hmm. right and 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 having these patterns because that'll actually help you in the long run right because this is often this is a marathon right it may not necessarily be a hundred meter sprint. And so being able to have these rituals to be able to, uh, and routines to be able mm -hmm. to do on a regular basis to keep you sort of set in a, in a path. Yeah. Yeah. And we have, we've been offering yoga to our patients. And of course it's all on zoom still with um, us being uh, careful of what's going on in the community and the world, but people come to, there's one that's mindfulness and breathing. And then there's one that's more of an active yoga, but it's a time where people know at five o'clock on Tuesday, nine o'clock Friday morning, this is what I'm doing. And this is for me. And I think a lot of us hate to put ourselves first, but it's important because if you don't care for yourself, you can't care for anybody else. And self-care is never selfish. And I think that's what mindfulness coping and all of these strategies are, are to make yourself a better person each day and to make yourself feel more positive and grateful. And, you know, even just a simple thing, I think a way of being mindful is having a gratitude journal even just thinking of three things you're grateful for or writing it down each day and knowing what you're grateful for is a way to be mindful. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do that aren't necessarily 30 minutes of mindfulness or a way to start thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, with that gratitude journal, um, you know, just doing seven minutes a day um, or even seven minutes uh, or, or even a gratitude letter, Mm -hmm. Right. How cool would it be to write a letter to someone who you're grateful for, whether they're alive or not? Mm -hmm. Just the act of writing that and then reading it aloud to someone, not only does it make you feel good, it actually makes that other person who's actually heard it, heard the message, feel good too. I love that. Whether it, they're the recipient of that, right? And so, and what if you did that once a month? Like, what could be the impact of that, right? Um, and then the, 
you know, thinking about three good things that happened that day. Mm -hmm. Right. And it could, and, and, you know, as you said, the, the gratitude, um, what, what are you grateful for? Or, you know, what, what is someone, and when you're, when you're actively thinking about some of this stuff, if you want to be more specific, you can say, okay, what is something that, that you did mm -hmm. that affected someone in a positive way? Or if someone did that for you, how did it make you feel? And what does it say about that person? Yeah. Right. And when you do this on a regular basis, you're actually much happier. Actually. Yeah, and it's something you can do with your friends and family. I um, recently mm -hmm. had a dinner with my 17-year-old niece, and she said, all right, let's do our rose thorn and bud at the dinner table. And being that I have two sons, we never really um, engaged in that way. But she said, a rose is something that you feel happy about. A thorn is something that's been difficult and sharing it is letting it go. And a bud is something you're looking forward to. And it was a wonderful, not only a wonderful and meaningful conversation, but it can be done anywhere, anytime. And that was a beautiful way for us all to share about our day and it, we start, it was just, it, to me, it's something I would love to do more often, you know, and simple. Yeah. And it's that power of connection, right? And yeah. I think also figuring out, like, who's, who are people you can reach out to? Mm -hmm. Like, who's, who's in your court, mm -hmm. right? And, and they don't necessarily have to be the coach. <laughs> they don't necessarily have to be, you know, someone who's starting with you, Right. Uh, on the court, it could be someone who's on the bench and they could just be available when you're needed. Yeah. Or when you need them, right? So I would just keep that in mind also because uh, that can be really powerful. And I think the other thing is there are many people who often want to help, but they don't know how, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, you know, just asking and, and letting them know what you need. Mm -hmm. I think that's also very important. And there's, a, there's actually a, an app that we found um, called uh, Lots of Helping Hands. Yep. There's a couple right. of them, Care Gather, yeah. um, Caring Calendar. There's a bunch. And it makes the, I think it makes it easy. I had a tough time asking people for help with my twins. I just felt like I could do it all. You know, I'm going to go to chemo and then I'm going to pick them up from preschool and then I'm going to serve them dinner. And it's exhausting. And I think that we try to juggle everything. You know, we're trying to juggle all mm. these balls. and when you have cancer, you need to figure out which balls are glass and which are rubber and the glass balls are going to break. So you got to keep them up in the air. And that's obviously feeding your children and maybe it's your job or things, but the rubber balls that can bounce have to be delegated. And I do think as hard as it is, it's easier with these apps because you can say, put on the app, I need, um, you know, this picked up or this errand run, and then people sign up and you don't have to necessarily call Mary to say, Mary, I need this. And I think it's a wonderful way of letting people help you in a meaningful way, rather than getting a lot of possible casseroles and flowers, which, you know, <laughs> happens when people are sick from the good heart of people, but probably there are things that people can do that are more helpful. So I'm glad you brought that up because there's a lot of ways that, and that to me is a great way to cope, like to be able to allow others to help is helping you and helping them in a meaningful way. Yeah. And it's connecting. Yeah. I think that's Definitely. the other beautiful thing about it. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the other thing that, that happens often is, you know, people end up not being in touch with folks because there's so much going on. And then, and then they sort of like may lose people, mm -hmm. right? And, um, but obviously it's complicated, right? You may, you may be so busy going to, you know, going to your appointments or mm -hmm. not feeling well, right? But just recognizing that there's so many different ways to communicate these days, yeah. <laughs> right? And then figuring out which ways you want to communicate, whether that's via text. So nowadays, you know, I'd say most people would probably have a cell phone. So, you know, as simple as, you know, sending a text that can be helpful for some people. And if that's helpful for you, let people know that. Mm -hmm. And also to right. let, when you look at your care partners, the people surrounding you, whether it's family or friends, think about what role they're the best at. You may have a friend who's that person that goes to the doctor with you. They take the good notes. They ask the right questions. They're supportive, but not in your face, you know, but you may have another friend who makes the best chicken noodle soup. And that's something that they can do. 
And you may have another friend who quietly listens and doesn't judge when you're feeling down. But I think it's important that you kind of identify that in your head so you know who to go to for what, because everybody is helpful in different ways. Yeah. And then figuring out what's helping and what's harming. Mm -hmm. Right. Really critical. Hard. Hard to do. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, what are what are some... um, apps that you like to use, you know, for, you were mentioning about mindfulness, what are some apps or sites that you you go to? Yeah, I mean, Calm is one of the most ones that people use a lot, but it is, there is a cost for it. So as it is on our list, we are careful to say, yes, there's a cost for this. Um, I know Headspace is one that people use. Um, We have a, there's one that does, um, I know Calm does a lot of sleep stories that people really like. Um, so there's so many good apps, um, that people can use to help train them. And you can even put a reminder on your phone to do it every day at a certain time. And the apps will help you do that in terms of working to stay centered, to stay focused, to put everything down one time of the day for a few minutes to just, you know, recharge. Um, I think a lot of us are running on empty and if you don't keep your cup full, you can't keep going. And how do you recharge? How do you, what brings you joy? You know, really, whatever brings you joy is what every person in this world should be doing every day for a part of their day, something that brings them joy. It's pretty simple, but not everybody does it. And I think that's a simple way. You know, is it walking your dog? Is it calling your mom? Is it um, gardening? Whatever it is, make sure that you are doing things that bring you joy, because I think that is a way to put yourself very in a small way first and give yourself self-care. I love that. That's actually my favorite question when I talk with patients. Yeah. Like, so tell me, what brings you joy? And uh-huh. you'll see some people go from being feeling sick to, oh my God, you know, I love okay. this, this, and that. It, it's, it's lovely. Yeah. I thing. often ask patients, like, how's your spirit? And I think they're so used to be asking, like, how's my cancer or this pain or that pain? And they forget yeah. that they have a spirit and a soul. And, you know, that usually brings tears, but tears of recognition that this is tough. And I do need to recognize that. So there's a lot of things to think about when, you know, you're going through tough times. And I hope that um, we've given some good ideas to help people to get through that. And, and, and recognizing that it's important to be seen and we see you, there's a lot of people who want to see you and get you through this. And I would, I would find, find those partners, find, you know, whether they're a care team or your family or, or friends, whoever they are finding your network. Yeah. I think that's, that's something that's really important. I think many people have that easily and some people don't. Mm -hmm. And um, it's easier to have a network sometimes now through zoom, because if your family is in another country, which we often have at at Hopkins, they they are still supportive because they can be in on the meetings. They can, you know, be in, on your FaceTime during chemo. I mean, there's a lot of ways to connect now that we didn't have 20 years ago. And I think that's can be positive for a lot of patients. Um, I know people have Zoom parties where they, you know, play games with friends that they don't see often. So, and also getting back together in person, but a lot of our patients are still very wary of that as they're immunocompromised through treatment and want to still keep their distance as uh, just flu season and, you know, all of that. But um I think that is important, knowing who can help you, knowing how they can help you, and just knowing how you can help yourself. And I think one of the best ways is through this mindfulness. And I'm hoping that, you know, maybe with a few minutes left, you could lead us into some type of short mindfulness exercise that we could do together with uh, everyone who's watching. Sure. Would you be sure. happy? Would you do that for us? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. So, I mean, I think, as you said, some, some of this can be super simple. And so what I'd like for you to do is just sit back and just take some calm, comfortable breaths. And what I'd like for you to do is just put your hand on your heart and just take calm, comfortable breath. In and out. In. And out. In. And out. And if you'd like, you can even do this for a couple minutes. 
And you'll see that after a couple minutes, your mind sort of comes down. So that could be one exercise that you do. There's another exercise that I love doing, not only with my patients and their families, but I also do this with my colleagues, actually. I do this with a lot of the trainees that I work with. And so what I'd like to do is, and this is gonna be about a three, about a three minute exercise. So, so please um, see if you can see if it helps. So again, put your hand on your heart. You can close your eyes and again, take calm, comfortable breaths. Just in. Now, you know, I want you to visualize one by one three things you are grateful for. Just visualize it like it's in front of you. It's happening right now. It can be a person or an experience. Just give thanks. Next, what I want you to do is just imagine a light between your eyebrows and just focus on that light. And that light could be light, it could be energy, it could even be the divine, whatever you want it to be. And imagine that light entering your body, healing the things that need to be healed. Feeling any pain, any frustrations, any disappointments, any sadness, healing any uncertainty you may have, just healing and washing over you. And that same light sending out energy all throughout your body, strengthening the best parts of you, strengthening your mind, your heart, your love, your compassion, your sense of humor, your hope, your resilience through this experience, strengthening. And finally, one by one, I want you to visualize three things you're gonna create or accomplish. It can be as simple as I'll bring a smile to someone's face. Visualize it happening the way you want it to happen just like athletes do before they go into a court or a track or a field. Visualize it happening and celebrate each one like it's happening for you at this moment. Celebrate it with a smile. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So again, I, I find what works for you. You can try these different apps. Now, there's another one that I use called Budify. Uh, there's another one that I really love um, called Breathing Room. Um, you can actually, they actually also have free, they've got a handful of free um, exercises uh, that I like. Um, uh, the UCLA has a Mindfulness Awareness Research Center. And if you Google UCLA MARC, they have free meditations there. Uh, I know our hospital, uh, our, uh, we have uh, the Connor Integrative Network uh, and there's free meditations there on, on our site. So there's a, a wealth of resources that are also free that you actually have access to if, if you do have access to technology, which I'd say majority of folks here may have. Um, and so find what works for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, inviting me today. And I really enjoy talking to you. And I really, um, I hope that, you know, I know we're going to have some questions and answers, but um, anyone can reach out to me personally, if they have questions or answers and get my information, I'm happy to help in any way. I just uh, appreciate everyone being here. And I thanks force for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and Jill, this was wonderful to co collaborate, you know, since I've left Hopkins and uh, it's, um, I'm so proud of the great work you've been doing. 
through the years. And I'm honored Thanks to so have you for a friend. Yeah. Yeah, we miss you. Thanks so much. Hope all is well. They're lucky to have you. So um, thanks again. And I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Thanks.